why do bad things happen to good people? It's, it's a question that people do ask, uh, particularly in times when a big event has happened in the world. I think most recently we would think there's been a big earthquake in Nepal, um, and many thousands, I don't know exactly, uh, have apparently died. And it would seem that, I think most people would say, those are, are good people, perhaps. They haven't done anything particularly that uh, deserves their death, most people would say. Perhaps we might think uh, a little further back, and we would think of that, that plane crash where the, the pilot apparently was uh, slightly, slightly mad, perhaps, but in any case, he, he, he dove the plane into the mountains, and all those, those hundreds of people who were on that, that flight, they all died. And again, you'd say, what did those people deserve? Why did they die? Um, it's, it's a common pe question people ask. And we also think about it in our own lives, something bad happens. And I think all of us would say, or we'd, we'd like to think of ourselves as, as, as basically good. You know, maybe we have our flaws, maybe we have our faults, but we, we tend to think of ourselves as, as basically good. And therefore it doesn't seem right, perhaps, that things, bad things happen to us. Maybe a loved one dies, or we get an illness, or or something of that, that order, and, and again we think, well, I'm a good person, why is this happening to me? And it's a reasonable question to ask, I think, but we should see what God has to say about it, and I think we, when we look from God's perspective, we find we've actually got slightly the wrong question, and uh, I'll come on to explain what I mean by that um, in a bit. So. If you'll, we'll come back to this reading that we just took from Ezekiel. It's really helpful to set out some of um, God's thoughts about um, the nature of his judgment and, and whether or not he is fair, because many people take the conclusion of, of good people, apparently good people dying, and say God isn't fair. And I think we should, we should look at that and see what God has to say for himself. But first let's turn forward, just to examine that, that premise that we've all got, that we're all basically good people. And let's see what some Jesus has to say about that. Mark and chapter 10. Um, if you'll come with me there in the New Testament. I think uh, when, when people think about who's a good person um, and you want to name an example of a good person, I think many people would, at least if they don't immediately think of Jesus, would agree that Jesus was fundamentally a good person. If, if you're going to have a definition of a good person, I think Jesus, Jesus is it. But let's see what Jesus says about that. So Mark and chapter 10. Um, and there's a, there's a man who comes to, to Mark, to, to Jesus, sorry, at this point. Mark chapter 10, I'll read from verse 17. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And then he goes on to ask, answer his question. So, Jesus is called good, and I think all of us would, would think about Jesus and say, yes, that's, that's a good man right there, but he, Jesus himself, he says, don't call me good, I'm not good. He says, no one is good, but God alone. That's what Jesus says, and that's quite striking. That means we've asked the wrong question straight from the outset. Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, Jesus has just told us there's nobody who's good, so we're asking the wrong question. Why do bad things happen to good people? So I think we should maybe think, well, well what is it we should be asking? And why, why is it that Jesus says no one is good? Why does he say he's not good? <coughs> well, the reason we get, if we come to, to Romans in chapter 3, we can see, see some more about exactly why it is that we can't consider ourselves good. That it's not right for us to consider ourselves good. If we come to Romans and chapter 3, This is, this is what the writer to the Romans says. Romans um, chapter 3, um, and if we just read, just read, it's talking about um, the law of God uh, in verse 21. So if we start from there, now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Sorry, let's, let's start again there. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's our state. 
There is no distinction between us. We can't make that, this is a good person, this is a bad person. There's no distinction in God's eyes. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. That is our state. That is the case for all of us. So none of us can really say we're a good person, because in God's eyes we're all sinners. And that's, that's the way God sees us. None of us, have fought, none of us have reached that glory of God. We've all fallen short in one way or another. And so there's a consequence for that. Um, and we, we've read it. If we come back to our reading then, Ezekiel chapter 18, we can see what the consequence for us all being in that category of sinners is. Ezekiel chapter 18. It's a, it's a wonderful chapter and it's good to read all of it. Um, it does talk a lot about God's judgment and the way he, he, he looks at things. But if in particular, if we come to verse 4, this is what God says. He says, Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins will die. That's what God says. The soul who sins will die. And we've just seen from Romans that that's all of us. Every single <coughs> one. We're all sinners, so we will all die. And that's, that's fair, that's right. Sin is, is something against God. It's it's totally unacceptable to God. And therefore it's fair, it's just that we die for our sin. And therefore we can't say when, when things happen in the world, that's not fair, God isn't being fair, because God is being fair. He's, he's allowing us to die, he's, he's, he's putting us to death, because we have sinned against him. And that's why these bad things that we think about happen. He's, he's doing those things to us. And it, it, many people would say, oh, maybe God isn't in control of those things, or he's maybe not paying attention, or he's thinking about other things. And, and maybe, maybe it's the devil that's causing these bad things. That's what some, some in other churches say. They say that there's another power that that's causes these bad things to happen. And that's not the case either. If we come to the, book, the prophecy of Isaiah, in chapter 45, you can see that we can't... We can't say that these, these things come from, from some other source, some other power. Isaiah, and chapter 45. This is what God is describing himself, and describing what he's like in his character. Isaiah 45, and we'll start reading at verse 5. This is what God says. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I will gird me, you though you have not known me, that men may know from the rising to the setting of the sun, there is no one beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other, the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these. This is what God says about himself. We'll carry on reading. Verse 8. Strip down, O heavens, from above. Let the clouds pour down righteousness. Let the earth open up, and salvation bear fruit, and righteousness spring up with it. I, the Lord, have created it. And woe to the one who quarrels with his maker, an earthenware vessel among the vessels of earth. Will the clay say to the potter, What are you doing? Or the thing you are making say, He hath no hands. This is... This is what God sees when we ask, even ask this question, why do bad things happen to good people? God is in control of all things. He's the creator. He's made the whole earth. He's given us our lives. He's made us, and he's made us in his image. And so he is in control of all things, as it says there in verse 7. He causes well-being and creates, my version has calamity, some versions might have evil. Um, but again, God's in control of these things. And more to the point, verse 9, we shouldn't quarrel with him. He doesn't have to even explain himself. He doesn't have to explain himself to us. We, we, we shouldn't be really asking this question and saying, why are you doing these things, God? God? We know God is right. That's the nature of our God. And he's being fair to us because we sin and we deserve to die. And so God brings these bad things, these calamities, on us. And yet, God doesn't have to explain, but he doesn't have to. We don't have the 
the ability to demand an answer from him, but God loves us and he does give us an answer. And we should look at what that answer is, why it is that these, these things happen. Perhaps our question now, rather than being why do bad things happen to good people, we're now thinking about why do bad things happen to all people. And if we're asking that question, we should come back to the beginning of the Bible, that creation that God was talking about when he talked about the heavens and the clouds and so forth, and that God as creator. Genesis and chapter 3, and come back to the first man. Genesis chapter 3, and we see where these bad things come from. Chapter Genesis chapter 3, and we'll start at verse 17. This is obviously the, the, t the tale of what happened to Adam and Eve, and the events in the Garden of Eden where they sinned against God, the first sin, they took that fruit they were commanded not to take from the tree. And this is the result, this is what God says to Adam as a result of that <coughs> sin that Adam and Eve have committed. <coughs> Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Then to Adam, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. <clears throat> this is what God says about the things, the hard things of life. He says he has cursed the ground. Because of man's sin, God has cursed the ground. This is why we have to work. This is why we find life hard. We have to work hard to, to get bread to eat. We have to work hard to provide for ourselves. We can't just wander around taking fruit from the trees anymore. We have to, we have to work for our food, and we have to, and we, we also know that we're going to return to the dust, that's what it says in there in verse 19, you are dust and to dust you shall return, we are going to die because of our sin, as we've already seen. <coughs> and so, ultimately we can say that this is what happens to all of us, we're all under this curse because we're all descended from Adam. And so we have this, this fate for all of us, and it's, again, right and just that God should do this, because it results from our sin. <coughs> but I think it's important here to be very clear, because there's a mistake people can say. They can, many people make, can, can make this, this mistake when they think about this, and they, they, they understand this teaching, which is to say, okay, so there's a curse, and we're all going to die <coughs> because of our sin. And then people go and they look at their lives and they look at other people's lives in particular and say, that bad thing happened to those people, therefore they must have done a particular sin which caused that bad thing to happen. You know, there must be a reason, there must be a particular sin to find that. And, well, of course, sometimes there is when there's a direct judgment from God. We cannot make that conclusion about anyone. It's not right for us to judge in that way because that's not the way God sees things. God sees us all as under sin. And so we're all going to be judged in that way. And we can't point to one particular thing and say, that's the reason that bad thing happened to you. The whole book of Job, we're not going to look at it particularly, but the whole book of Job is, is that argument where the friends of Job say to Job, you have sinned, and these are the sins you've done, and this is why all these bad things have happened to you. And Job says, no, I haven't. And, of course, ultimately God answers that argument, but we should maybe see that in a more concise form if we come forward to Luke in chapter 13, and we see what Jesus says about this, this question. It's very important to, you know, really emphasise this, because it's, a, it's something that we can easily get confused about, and see something bad happening, and think there must be a particular sin that's caused that, and that's, that's not the case. So Luke chapter 13. And if you'll turn with me there to Luke chapter 13. This is what Jesus says. Now, on the same occasion there were some present with, who reported to Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. 
But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Do you suppose that the eighteen on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is the way God thinks about these things. This is the teaching of Jesus, that we are all under sin, as we have already seen. We are all going to die for our sin. He says that we need to repent. And he says we can't look at events in the world, we can't look at that earthquake in the world, we can't look at plane crashes, we can't look at buildings falling down. Uh, anything we see in the world, we can't look at that and say, those people deserve that more than any one of us. We need to be humble. We need to say, I deserve that too. I deserve to die because I have sinned. And it's true for all of us. And we shouldn't forget it. And we shouldn't be quick to judge others and say, it's their, they, they deserve that. It's their fault. Because we are all in the same boat. We're all in the same, same condition. And if that were all of God's judgment, that would be that would be fair, it would be just, but it would be quite depressing, I think, if that was all the Bible had to say about this subject, that we're going to die. I don't think any of us would, would see much much hope in that. But that's not all the Bible has to say about this. And it's important to note there that there's 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 a way out. There's a there's a way out of this problem that we have of these these bad things, these calamities. Um, this, these disasters and ultimately death happening for us. Uh, and that is, as Jesus says twice in this passage you just read, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So there's a way out. And the way out is repentance. Now, we need to repent if we're to avoid this, this fate of, all the, of everyone in the whole world. So what does repentance mean? I think it's, it's a fairly simple definition, but I think we should come and see the teaching about this. So if we come to Matthew in chapter 3, we can see, well, it's, it's, the, words, it's the teaching of Jesus and it's the teaching of, of John before Jesus. So, in fact, if we come to Matthew in chapter 4, we can see that this is a message that Jesus has, was preaching throughout his ministry. Matthew chapter 4, and the beginning of the preaching of our Lord Jesus Christ is Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This, was a, a core, this is the core teaching of what Jesus has to say. He's always talking about repentance and the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. That was the core of his message. And it still is, of course. It's a hope for all of us. But when he says these words, they've already been said just one chapter earlier on. It's not by Jesus this time, it's by John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 3, and verse 1. In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The same words that Jesus used. And in John's case, we see what that means. There's a direct result of that. So John says, verse 2, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in verse 5, we see what, what the result of it is. <coughs> then Jerusalem was going out to him, all Judea and all the district round about Jordan. They, being baptised by him in the Jordan River, as they confessed their sins. This is what repentance results in. This is what happens. John preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the people came to him, and they listened to his message, and they were baptised, and they confessed their sins. This is what repentance is. It's confessing our sins. It's acknowledging that we are sinful. It's not being proud and saying, I'm, I'm basically a good person. It's about saying, no, I acknowledge that I have sinned. I deserve to die. <clears throat> and we confess our sins, and we are baptised, and we resolve at that point to... <coughs> Not to go and sin no more, as Jesus uh, commands many different people. Now, of course, because we are human, we're going to fail at that. But that is what we're trying to do. That's what we're doing when we are baptised. We're washing away all our, 
former sins. And we are confessing our sins and we are trying to live a new life following the Lord Jesus of Christ, who of course was the only man who didn't sin in that way. Now, again, there's a, a problem we could have with this. We can say, oh, okay, I've repented. Now, bad things won't happen to me. Now I'm safe. And again, this is, it's a false piece of logic. Because we still, okay, we've repented and we've, we've been forgiven of our sins, but we are still fundamentally human and we still continue to fail. Although, of course, now that we've been baptised, we can ask God for forgiveness. And just to confirm that this is in fact the case, and it's not the case that once we're baptised, then life is suddenly brilliant and there's no more problems, we come to Matthew in chapter 24. We can see what Jesus told his disciples about this. Matthew chapter 24. And Jesus is, is talking in verse 3 to his disciples <coughs> privately. So there's no one else there, there's only Jesus and all his disciples, and they've all, of course, been baptized into the name of Jesus. So these are all, you would say, fundamentally good people. Perhaps not, we might think Judas wasn't, but again, all of the disciples here are included in what Jesus says. And this is what he says. Uh, verse, verse 6, Jesus says to them, oh, they, they're asking about what's, what's the sign of the coming and the end of the world. And verse 6, Jesus answers, you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you are not frightened, for these things must take place, for that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. In various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. They will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated of all nations because of my name. <coughs> At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many, because lawlessness has increased. Most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. <coughs> This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So this is what Jesus says about the idea that we are all, that once we're baptised, once we've repented, that we're, that we're then safe and there's no, no more bad things. Well, he says the to his disciples, those who are following with him, he says to them, they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you'll be hated of all nations because of my name. So, bad things definitely happen to those who trust in Jesus. That's definitely still the case. We're not going to be baptised and then live this perfect life with no more <coughs> cares or troubles. But that's. But God very clearly says, Jesus very clearly says that we are... <coughs> We, we still will have troubles in this world. But that's not, not only the entire story. It's not just that we have troubles before we're baptised, we have troubles after we're baptised. In which case, why would we be baptised? Well, there is still a hope. There is a reason we should want to be baptised. If you come to 1 Corinthians in chapter 10, we can see a little more about this subject. Because... Although, yes, we will still suffer troubles in our lives, if we believe in Jesus, then we know that God is, is caring for those who trust in him and who, who follow after him. God does care for those who are faithful. So if we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we can see what God says about temptation and trials in, in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Therefore let him who stands take heed that he does not fall. <coughs> no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able <coughs> but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. <coughs> this is what God says. He says that temptation or, or persecution or these troubles that we have, in our lives, God says he will make it so that we are able to endure it. 
ultimately we're still all going to die unless our Lord returns. But we know that God will make it so that we will endure. God doesn't want us to fail. He doesn't want us to get downhearted or depressed. He does want us to, to continue to trust in him and to serve him. And so God will bless us if we follow him and we look to him. It won't be an easy road, but we know that God does watch over those who trust in him. And in particular, God ultimately will be fair. He will be just. As we've read in Ezekiel chapter 18, the man who <coughs> is just and does right will live, and the man who sins will die. So, well, we're, we're all still sinners, so where is it that we're going to live? How is it that we're going to live, and how is God going to be fair? And I think the answer is not in this lifetime. We sometimes think that, <coughs> that God isn't being fair right now, and we, we need things to be fair now. And that's, that's not the way God works. God is fair, and he is just, but it's on his time scale. We can't demand God sort out our problems now. But we know that God does have a plan, and that does involve the end of all our problems and all our suffering. And the answer is the judgment. Matthew and chapter 25, if you'll turn with me there. This is another parable Jesus tells. Matthew and chapter 25. Jesus tells a parable about the sheep and the goats. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. <clears throat> when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before <coughs> him. He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and he gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and he gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and he invited me in. Naked, and he clothed me. I was sick, and he visited me. I was in prison, and he came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty, and gave you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brethren of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. And then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, ye accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and he gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and he gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and he did not invite me in. Naked, and he did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and he did not visit me. Then they themselves also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? <coughs> he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. This is how God makes things fair. He has a plan for the long term. He says that there will be this judgment at the time of that kingdom that Jesus talked about. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, this is the kingdom coming, the Son of Man, Jesus, returning to judge. And it says that those who are not following after God will go away into eternal punishment, into eternal death, perishing as <coughs> described elsewhere in the Bible. But those who are righteous will enter into eternal life. Now, I don't think we can quite comprehend what that is. We have lives now, and we think of our lives, and we think if they stretch on a bit longer, well, I'll just get a bit more decrepit, I'll get a bit older, I'll have more problems. That's not what eternal life is about. And I don't think we can also understand how long that is. We all live finite lives, but eternity is, is forever, and it just doesn't compare to what we have now. The, the Bible describes what life will be like in the kingdom. It describes us 
as having there being no more sickness or sorrow or pain, for the former things have passed away. It describes how men will run and not be weary, they will walk and not faint. This is, this is a life that is unlike our life now, it's a life without any of these troubles of this world, and it's a life forever in the kingdom of God. And all we have to do to be there is to repent, as Jesus told us, and to confess our sins and to follow after our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> this is how God makes things right. On his timescale, he will put all the, the, the bad things that happen in this world right. And he will make sure that we get what we deserve from this life. So let's look at what, what we've seen overall then. Let's, let's sum up. The first thing, again, this, this question, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, we saw already, if Jesus can't call himself good, then nobody can call themselves good. So then, why do bad things happen to all people? Well, bad things happen because of our sin. Because of our sin, we deserve to die. And again, that doesn't mean that we've done something particularly sinful if some bad thing happens to us. It's just that that is the nature of man. We all sin, so bad things, so calamities and disasters, they happen to all of us. But in order to escape from this, this inevitability of death, then we need to repent. We need to confess our sins. We need to be baptised in the name of Jesus. And we need to follow after the example of Jesus and to follow after but what God wants of us. And if we do that, then at the end, God will judge us, and he will be fair, but on his time scale, when he is ready to be fair, when he has allowed the course of this world to run as he wants it to. And then if we have done those things, if we have repented, if we have been baptised, if we have followed after our Lord Jesus Christ and helped those around us, then we can enter into that eternal life. And that is worth whatever troubles we have in this life now. It's worth it for eternal life in God's kingdom.